the studios of KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles. This is Uprising and I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It's Wednesday, December 3rd, 2014. We'll speak with oil analyst Michael Clare today. He's the author of The Race for What's Left, The Global Scramble for the World's Last Resources, and he'll explain why oil prices are currently so low and how that will impact our economy and our planet. Plus, on the 15th anniversary of the battle in Seattle, we'll examine the legacy of the historic 1999 anti-WTO protests with Ben Mansky. And journalist and author Tan Sizwe Chimarenga joins us to further explore the questions of racism and police brutality sparked by Ferguson, Missouri. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Courtney Morris. She is an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. Hi, Courtney. Thanks, Sonali. Well, President Obama has chosen a long-serving Pentagon official, Ashton Carter, to replace Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel. Hagel was asked to resign soon after Democrats lost their Senate majority in early November because, according to the New York Times, he was considered by the White House, quote, too passive in the face of rising threats overseas. Mr. Carter is a physicist and former deputy defense secretary who notably purchased weapons on behalf of the Pentagon to boost U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. He has served under several administrations, particularly in matters involving the control of nuclear weapons, and he was expected to be the nominee to succeed Leon Panetta when Hegel, a Republican, was picked instead. There seems to be little Republican opposition to Carter's confirmation. Well, Courtney, it sounds like Ashton Carter will continue a pro-war Pentagon legacy, which is why perhaps both major parties like him. Do you agree? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, certainly I think that that's the case. I mean, when you look at Ashton Carter's record in the Department of Defense, he's someone who really uh, comes off as a, a company man in the sense that he will take orders from whoever is in command at the time that he's that he's serving. Uh, you know, he began his career under the Clinton administration, as you said, doing work around nuclear disarmament um, and uh, in the former Soviet territories of the Ukraine, Belarus, um, and also seeing uh, also overseeing uh, the uh, expansion of missile defense uh, capabilities in the United States. And so he's someone who's really a weapons guy, uh, has a long history of working with uh, both Democratic, under Democratic administrations, but also had very strong ties to the Bush White House. He served on Condoleezza Rice's, uh, her International Security Advisory Committee when she was Secretary of State. And so he's someone who's developed a reputation for playing nice with both sides of the aisle. Uh, just last year, John McCain was praising him at the Senate for his uh, insatiable intellectual curiosity. So Republicans really like this guy, and I don't think he's going to face much opposition uh, during his confirmation hearings uh, next year. And we'll see what effect that has on our foreign policy. Well, the Supreme Court this week is considering the case of Peggy Young versus United Parcel Service over pregnant employees' complaint that her longtime employer refused to accommodate her pregnancy-related request. Ms. Young's midwife had advised her to not lift more than 20 pounds during her pregnancy, but Young, who has worked as a delivery truck driver for many years, was told that uh, UPS's so-called pregnancy-neutral policies meant she was not to be treated as a disabled person. In 1978, the U.S. passed the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, but that law does not actually protect pregnant women from being discriminated against by their employers. The Wall Street Journal opined that, quote, the answer to dumb corporate behavior is market forces, not more legislating through regulation of the courts. Well, Courtney, do you think these mysterious market forces can create compassionate policies, or do we actually need the government to force corporations to respect uh, women and mothers? Well, if these mysterious market forces can produce more equitable policies, they certainly haven't done so uh, thus far. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that corporations don't make decisions based on the well-being of their workers. They make decisions based on what they perceive to be the bottom line. Uh, and in this case, the bottom line was that UPS decided that it simply could not uh, provide the resources that this worker uh, needed. Uh, in order to ensure that she would have a healthy pregnancy and would then, would, would then be able to continue her employment with, uh, with the company. So uh, at the end of the day, I really don't believe that this idea that the market is somehow going to intervene and deal with the question of employee discrimination on the basis of gender uh, is going to be delivered by some mysterious market force. Uh, companies are not going to do the right thing unless they're compelled by the state to do so. Uh, and so it, this seems to me to be a very clear case of pregnancy discrimination in, uh, of, in the case of Peggy Young. Um, but given the, the court's record on issues of reproductive justice and gender equality in the last year or so, uh, it, it remains to be seen whether or not the Supreme Court is going to feel the same way. And so this is a hugely important case right. uh, in terms of 
uh, of defending the, the rights of women as workers. Finally, a new study released yesterday by the Paris-based Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development found that corruption in multinational companies is rampant and that it's happening primarily in the Western world, not the global South. The OECD report, admitting that it has only found the, quote, tip of the iceberg, says that, quote, most international bribes are paid by large companies, usually with the knowledge of senior management. The majority of cases occurred in four industries, mining, construction, transportation and storage, and information and communication. They were largely paid in order to win state contracts, bypass customs, and avoid taxes. Now, Courtney, I'm assuming bribes are simply considered inside uh, as the cost of doing business. Are these part of the mysterious market forces at work again? Uh, the mystery market for, uh, strikes again. Yes, I would agree with that uh, with that statement. I, def I certainly think that this report is really important because it, it reveals the extent to which uh, governments in the developed world are complicit uh, in reproducing this system of global uh, corruption and, uh, and, uh, and empowering corporations, multinational corporations, to uh, to play outside of the rules, that there, that there really are no rules that apply to them. And so this is something that I think is really important because one of the things that it also suggests is that part of the reason why these states have been so reticent to rein in the private sector, even though they're engaging in all kinds of human rights abuses, uh, exploitative labor practices, uh, and really kind of egregious forms of corporate malfeasance, the reason why they haven't reined them in is partly because they're complicit in them and they don't want to be uh, revealed. They don't want the, the degree to which they're implicated to be revealed, but they also don't want to have to answer for the ways that they benefit from these right. systems of, of corporate corruption. So uh, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see this coming out, and there needs to be more work along these lines. Courtney, as always, thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. Bye, Sonali. Courtney Morris is an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. This is Uprising. We'll be right back. Back to Uprising, I'm Sonali Kohatkar. If you drive, you may have noticed that these days filling your gas tank has gotten a lot cheaper. This week, the average national price for a gallon of gasoline fell to $2.77, and the cost of a barrel of U.S. crude oil has fallen almost 40 percent compared to its peak in June. The lower oil prices have already had tremendous effects on the U.S. and world economy. While consumers may be celebrating at the gas pump, other countries despair. In Iran, lower prices will seriously impact the economy, which has already had to reduce its oil exports due to U.S.-imposed sanctions. In Venezuela, social programs, which are funded by oil exports, are likely going to suffer. And OPEC member countries will see their annual revenues shrink by $590 billion, while the American, Japanese, and European economies will experience substantial economic boosts with lower rates of inflation. For environmentalists, the bad news is that gas-guzzling SUV sales are once more on the rise. But lower oil prices may lessen the urgency of the Keystone XL pipeline project and possibly help its cancellation. But why are the prices falling in the first place? According to experts, U.S. production of shale oil through controversial practices like fracking has resulted in greater domestic oil supplies. This, along with decreasing demand for gas among an aging population and more fuel-efficient cars, may be why oil is so cheap. My guest is Michael Clare. He's a professor of peace and world security studies at Hampshire College. He's also the author of The Race for What's Left, The Global Scramble for the World's Last Resources. Welcome to Uprising, Michael. My pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, the Washington Post said that falling oil prices, quote, could be one of the biggest transfers of wealth in history, potentially reshaping everything from talks over Iran's nuclear program to the Federal Reserve's policies to further rejuvenate the U.S. economy. Is it that serious? I wouldn't go that far, but lower oil prices certainly are going to have far-reaching consequences for geopolitics, at least in the short term. And in the long term, you know, lower oil prices may show that the history, the long-term history trajectory 
of ever increasing oil consumption might be coming to an end and that would have dramatic consequences if it's true. Well, how do you explain why oil is so cheap? And when I say cheap, of course, I mean simply in dollars. We'll talk about other costs later. Okay, well, now let's bear in mind uh, oil is cheap relative to its highs of recent years. Okay. It's been $100 a barrel. It's now around $70 a barrel. But it, it wasn't so long ago when oil was $20 a barrel. So it's gone up and now it's come down again. Why is that? The main reason is supply and demand. It's always supply and demand. The high price of oil reflected expectations that demand would grow around the world, especially in developing countries like China, India, Brazil, and Turkey. And the rate of growth in those countries has slowed down. So the demand for oil ha has not increased as was expected. In Europe, you have economic doldrums, so demand isn't rising there. So demand, demand isn't rising as it once was. In the meantime, supply is increasing. It's increasing in large part because of hydrofracking in the United States and increased shale oil production in North Dakota and in Texas. So you have more oil on the market, less demand, and prices fall. So let's talk about the other costs, and that is the actual cost to the environment, to our collective health, to the health of the planet. Um, we don't measure these, uh, and, and the, the market doesn't measure these, but what is the possible impact for there to be this glut of oil? Could it actually result in spurring more production, more energy consumption, and therefore more emissions? You know, if, if the demand isn't there, uh, I don't think that, that the lower prices are going to have that big an impact. Now, it's true, as you said earlier, that people are going back to SUVs. Yeah. Um, so that's one consequence. On the other hand, the low price of oil may discourage investment in very costly oil projects like Canadian tar sands, which are very bad for the environment. So it, it, the effect on the environment is mixed. What I'm, what I'm wondering, what I'm wondering here is whether or not the slowdown in demand reflects a long-term trend away from petroleum and towards uh, public transit and, and uh, electric cars, hybrid cars. That is that the world public is moving away from its historic addiction to oil to other fuels. And if this is the case, then that's very good news. Hmm. So the other question is, and may, that may be related to what you were just saying, is how low could oil prices go? Where will it dip? OK, well, what I suspect is that oil prices will continue to fall for some time. But at some point, at some point, the cost will go down so much that uh, oil companies and investors will stop investing in high cost oil like Canadian tar sands and Arctic oil. Right. And if they stop investing in deep offshore oil and, and the like, very costly oil that doesn't turn a profit unless the price is $80 or $90 or $100 a barrel. So if the investment slows down, then at some point supply will contract and the rising demand will push prices back up. Hmm. Now, what happened to this idea of peak oil that a lot of people were touting, environmentalists were touting it as um, an argument to switch to renewable sources of energy? Robert Kuttner, writing in the American Prospect, said uh, that, uh, that he criticized this, this idea. And he also said that low oil prices are history's greatest case of market failure. Um, so essentially, did the shale production, fracking, uh, uh, turn? that peak oil graph that many of us had seen um, over on its head? Yes, what's happened is that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when we were talking about peak oil, and I certainly did a lot of that, we didn't appreciate the importance of the new technologies like hydrofracking and Arctic and deep offshore 
the ability of those technologies to exploit oil that was previously inaccessible. So 10 or 15 years ago, if you were looking at what the industry calls conventional oil, oil that comes out of the ground easily or from uh, coastal areas, from areas that are with easily within reach, uh, we have seen a peak in conventional oil. So we were correct in that respect. However, the industry has added huge supplies of what they call unconventional oil, deep offshore, Arctic oil, tar sand, shale oil, and other forms of hard to reach oil. And it turns out the technology to do that has improved substantially. So there will be increasing supplies of unconventional oil making up for the disappearance of easy conventional oil and this will last for some time. If indeed our oil prices have fallen because of this glut of oil as a result of unconventional sources and that in turn is going to make it less likely for for example permits for deep sea oil drilling for the uh, Keystone XL pipeline to go through then these large oil companies have essentially um, bit themselves in the foot. In, in a way that's so. Uh, and this very much depends on what I was talking about earlier. That is, how deep is our addiction to petroleum worldwide, mm -hmm. consumers' addiction to petroleum? If our addiction remains powerful, that is, people keep buying cars powered by oil, eventually prices will rise and that will make it profitable to go into the Arctic and to exploit Canadian tar sands and so forth. If on the other hand, if on the other hand people start moving away from petroleum dependence and buy more uh, fuel efficient cars and hybrids, as is happening in Europe, for example, and in Japan, if that happens, then a lot of these assets, uh, these unconventional oil assets will prove to be a bubble um, and they'll become less and less valuable. Well, uh, Michael Clare, let's talk about some economies that do depend on oil sales and what the impact will be on them. I mean, there's Venezuela, but there's also Russia, which on uh, this week, just this week, canceled a major uh, gas pipeline that was supposed to transport Russian gas under the Black Sea to the Balkans. And the European Union is celebrating this as a political victory because of tensions over Ukraine. But could low oil prices have something to do with it? Uh well, for, that was a natural gas pipeline, mm -hmm. so the, the price of oil is not directly connected to it. Um, but um, certainly uh, Euro European Union sanctions on Russia are having an effect. The, the, the Europeans are increasingly angry about what Russia is doing in Ukraine and Crimea. And they did put pressure on Bulgaria and other countries that were going to participate in that natural gas pipeline called South Stream not to cooperate. So in the end, Putin was forced to cancel that plan. What he is going to do, however, is reroute that South Stream pipeline to Turkey, which is going to benefit from right. a, 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 cost, a, a supply of gas. Uh, so he hasn't entirely lost there. However, your, your earlier question, is Russia suffering from the drop in prices? And the answer is yes, very much so. Russia's budget uh, assumes that oil prices are going to be 90 or $100 per barrel, and, and oil supplies half or more of Russia's state income. And with the price going down like this, it, it means Putin has a lot less money to play with. And, and this is going to uh, really bite uh, as he moves forward. Uh, finally, let's uh, wrap up our conversation with a broader look. If we care about the health of our planet and the fact that extracting uh, energy itself has an impact and then using that energy has that longer term impact of emissions, if environmentalists have been relying on peak oil as an, as, as a, an argument which now doesn't hold, how do we reframe the approach to the fossil fuel industry and rethink the real costs? That, that is a very good and a very important question. And the answer I have for that 
is to talk about extreme energy, extreme oil, that as the easy oil disappears, as it is very rapidly, we're becoming increasingly dependent on extreme energy, Arctic energy, tar sands, shale oil. All of these are much more damaging to the environment, uh, produce much more carbon dioxide, are more costly, are a threat to indigenous peoples and endangered species. Talk about the extreme forms of extraction that we now depend on to maintain the supply of petroleum. And there are many, many people willing to unite around that. Indigenous peoples, farmers who are losing water, people whose lands are being invaded. That's the way I would talk about it. Michael Clare, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been my pleasure. Michael Clare is a professor of peace and world security studies at Hampshire College, and his book is called The Race for What's Left, The Global Scramble for the World's Last Resources. This is Uprising. When we come back, we'll take a look at what happened 15 years ago in Seattle with my guest, Ben Mansky. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. This week marks the 15th anniversary of a momentous occasion in history, the battle in Seattle. Considered a major turning point for direct democracy movements the world over, tens of thousands of people from varying walks of life gathered in Seattle, Washington in late November and early December 1999. Their self-proclaimed task was to shut down the World Trade Organization's ministerial meeting. Organized labor unions joined forces with environmental groups. Students rallied alongside veteran activists. Today, together, they brought the city to a halt and for a precious few days captured world attention to the nefarious activities of a global organization intent on rewriting the rules of finance to favor the rich. Despite the September 11th attacks a few years later, throwing off the momentum of the anti-globalization movement, as it came to be called, Many of those same activists regrouped. They formed the backbone of the anti-Iraq war protests. Some even occupied Wall Street more than 10 years after Seattle. In the meantime, direct democracy became even more commonplace overseas, even in some countries where mass movements had not been seen in years. The Arab Spring emerged and continues. Quebec to the north and Mexico to the south rose up. And today, Ferguson has become the flashpoint for a democratic demand for justice. Just how historic was the battle in Seattle? My guest is Ben Mansky. He's the president of Liberty Tree Foundation, a group working to build a, a democracy movement for the U.S. since 2004. And he's recently written about the Seattle uprising, uh, asking if it's still a, f a force in world events. Welcome to Uprising, Ben. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. So how historic was it, especially for the U.S., where mass movements of that kind at that point, especially in the 1990s, had become a sort of rarity? Well, for those of us who were there, it was a moment that many of us uh, had, didn't think that we would necessarily see in our lifetimes. Uh, it was a moment of uh, genuine liberation in the tens of thousands, hundred thousand people who gathered in the streets of Seattle uh, we could see the new society uh, emerging, the power of mass movements when we come together and when we exert democratic power. And that is something that uh, luckily we've gotten to experience several times uh, since then. Uh, but I've heard from people who were watching the events in Seattle, around the United States and around the world, that for them it had a similar kind of effect. Uh, it was very inspiring to uh, regular people who had not become engaged. Many people became engaged after what they saw happen in Seattle. Many though, of those who were involved in various movements uh, stepped up their activity and began to refocus, to say, well, if this was significant, how can we build more of this? Right. And so how did the sort of uh, strategizing on the ground in Seattle build the, uh, 
uh, basis for how people began to organize oftentimes fr from there on out in terms of leaderlessness, in terms of how decisions could be made collectively. A lot of those things were pioneered in Seattle. They were pioneered or they were reformed uh, and refined. Um, some of the slogans of the current era were developed in Seattle. Some of the tactics were developed in Seattle. But the reality is that much of what came out of Seattle was already in play in the 1990s uh, in various movements that had been far away from the centers of power, specifically those engaged in wilderness defense, those uh, based in indigenous communities, uh, and in my case, uh, those of us who were involved in the radical environmental movement, um, we had had to develop methods of nonviolent direct action that were more sophisticated than those of the state and than those of the private security and the uh, federal police forces that we were dealing with. And that came into play in Seattle in a very effective way. Uh, the police were undisciplined. The protesters were supremely disciplined. And we won the battle of the street. We won the battle of the city. And we actually set back the World Trade Organization for decades. Hmm. And uh, you brought up the police, and I think that's a really important point, because if there were lessons to be learned in organizing in Seattle, the police also, in many ways, uh, had many lessons they could have taken away from what happened in Seattle. The uh, former police chief of Seattle has since come out, uh, and he's been a guest on our show, um, really regretting what the Seattle police did to activists and protesters there. And I'm wondering if at that time, in November, early December of 1999, police um, uh, brutality to these protesters, did it in a way increase sympathy for them worldwide, have the opposite effect to what the police might have wanted? Well, I think it did have the opposite effect in the long term, and it certainly had the opposite effect in the immediate term in the Seattle region, with tens of thousands of people uh, who were residents, uh, the people of Western Washington, joining the protests uh, after hearing directly uh, from eyewitnesses about what was happening. But it would be a mistake to think that uh, police tactics uh, became less violent in the years immediately following Seattle. If anything, they became right. uh, more effective and violent, as we saw in the streets of Miami here in the United States, as we saw in Genua, as we saw in Cancun. Uh, and in other sites of protest. Um, one other point I just want to return to that you raised this question of the significance of Seattle in terms of tactics and nonviolent strategy. Um, it was that so many people came to Seattle, saw what happened in Seattle, and then brought that experience, that discipline of nonviolent direct action back with them to the communities that they came from. So in a way, Seattle became a cauldron out of which uh, many of the forms of resistance that we now see as commonplace emerged. And I should say, I personally cut my political activist teeth, uh, not at Seattle, I had to miss it sadly because of family obligations, but showed up at the Washington DC anti-World Bank protest a few months later, where the legacy of the, in Seattle was immediately palpable. Um, let's talk about how the Seattle protests might have actually impacted what it was set out to do, which is stop the World Trade Organization in, this, in its tracks. It's a global organization with a fairly secretive agenda, laid bare, and in many we, uh, ways, as you said, set the agenda back for years. But just last week, the WTO triumphantly announced its first ever global trade deal in history, 160 countries unanimously agreeing, and it requires unanimous agreement in order to have any deals, unanimously agreeing on a deal that would apparently inject more than a trillion dollars into the global economy. The deal still has to be ratified by the governments of each of these individual countries by next year, which is a huge challenge. But um, the WTO is touting this as a great victory. How do you see it? Well, I'd say that they uh, went back uh, 10, they, they were set back, uh, their agenda was set back so far that any kind of step forward for them uh, must look impressive uh, internally, and they certainly want to uh, you know, tout the U.S.-India deal, which has now been expanded into a multilateral uh, deal, uh, as some great uh, recovery. But um, those I know who are focused on trade policy today uh, don't seem to be focusing on uh, this so much as fighting the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the parallel uh, transatlantic TTIP uh, partnership that's being proposed. So I think really Seattle has, uh, post Seattle, the WTO has not recovered uh, in any significant way. Uh, they have not been able to move on to 
regulating services. Uh, they have not been able to going after public education and water. Uh, and I think that um, certainly what happened with U.S. India on food security was significant, and it was a victory for transnational capital. Uh, but it's not it's not uh, at all what uh, Bill Clinton and the WTO uh, had envisioned in the 1990s. The other thing I would just say about Seattle is that it is true that it was about trade, but it was also about building a movement for democratic power against corporate capital. And that was one thing that I think is quite significant about the Seattle moment in that pre-Seattle you had uh, multi-issue coalitions that were coming together throughout the 1990s on various issues of common concern, and trade was one of those. Uh, but after Seattle, you had a sense of a common movement, of a more synthetic movement, in which we're all in it together. And I think one aspect of that that you can see today is the way in which those who a month ago, uh, or two months ago, I should say, were in the streets in New York City uh, for the People's Climate March are also oftentimes those who are organizing Ferguson Solidarity rallies right. across the country. It's all one movement now. Right. Well, um, let's go back to those two uh, couple of years following Seattle. You're right. It seemed at that time that this global movement, global anti-globalization movement, was unstoppable. And then, just less than two years later, the 9-11 attacks happened. And the Twin Towers were struck, setting a course, setting the United States and practically the whole world on a course that it was almost a, still today seems that we have yet to recover from. And did, many people looked back at, at that time and wondered if that whole uh, terrorist attack totally derailed the anti-globalization movement, did it? Well, I think it would be hard pressed to say that it didn't. Um, I was on a a uh, conference call with organizers for the next wave of IMF uh, protests in Washington, D.C., for, set for September 27th of 2001. Uh, and that was our regular call that was to be held on the evening of September 11th. And when we got on the phone that evening, and many of us were on the phone throughout the day, uh, it was clear that the September 27th protest would be a, in, a protest against the uh, impending invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, we could see what was coming. So there was a demonstration of 25 to 30,000 people in Washington, D.C. just two weeks after September 11th. And the anti-war movement escalated very quickly because what had been characterized as the anti-globalization movement, although it had already taken on other pro-democracy forms around the struggle over Florida and voting rights uh, that, that had emerged and that we were building at that time, that, that energy did go into building the anti-war movement. And it's the reason why, in my opinion, the anti-war movement escalated so quickly and so significantly in the United States uh, and, I think, around the world. Hmm. Uh, however, uh, it, it did take our eyes off the ball. It became a resistance movement as opposed to an affirmative movement that was uh, seeking uh, the objectives of uh, democratic reform, of revolution, of uh, expansions of existing rights in terms of voting rights, election reforms, taking on the power of corporations. We moved away from that uh, for a number of years. So then in the last five years alone, we've seen this huge explosion around the world from the Arab Spring movements, uh, as well as uh, to what's happening in Mexico. Um, and, and we see, of course, Occupy Wall Street several years ago. Um, do you see all of these as linked? And, and concurrent with that has been the rise in technology and, and our ability to communicate faster than ever. Um, of course, we are also being surveilled more than ever at the same time. So um, how do you see all of these trends as linked? Well, they are linked, and I can say that because we talk to one another. Uh, in 2009, following the global economic collapse, the beginning of this period, uh, we could see in Wisconsin with the Liberty Tree Foundation uh, and across the United States what was happening in Europe and in Latin America at that time in terms of mass youth-led student protests, strikes, occupations. Uh, and we knew people, <laughs> we know people uh, overseas, many of us in the U.S. who are active and vice versa. Uh, and so we got on the phone with them and we exchanged emails. Uh, and we held teach-ins, for example, on the anomalous wave uh, in Italy, which was a very significant movement that prefigured, uh, to use that term, uh, much of what came afterwards. Uh, in Wisconsin, which is where Liberty Tree is based, uh, 
uh, we knew that when Scott Walker was elected, we were next. And the day after he was elected, we started organizing something called the Wisconsin Wave. We held teleconference briefings with hundreds of people around the United States and around the world in which we uh, brought people onto the phone from Malaysia, from UK, from uh, Spain, from Chile, to brief us on how they were responding to this latest uh, austerity attack. Uh, and we began our own push. Uh, so the Wisconsin uprising was not spontaneous. It was organized. It was planned. Uh, and it actually, uh, the only thing that was surprising to those of us who were key organizers was how quickly we succeeded uh, in expanding the ranks of our movement. Right. Uh, from there came Occupy Wall Street and so on. So these things are connected and uh, intentionally so, and they need to be ever more so. And now there are more and more expressions uh, from people uh, of solidarity with one another, uh, Arab Spring protesters ordering pizza for protesters in Wisconsin, uh, people making connections between Gaza and Ferguson, et cetera. Ben Mansky, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We'll post a link to your article from our website, uprisingwithsonali.com. Is there a website you'd like to give out? Uh, the Liberty Tree Foundation org uh, is uh, an excellent organization entering our 10th year and uh, check it out. Check out the democracy conventions, the global climate convergence, move to amend some of our projects. Thank you so much, Ben. You bet. Thank you. My guest, Ben Mansky, is president of Liberty Tree Foundation. We've been talking about the legacy of the battle in Seattle 15 years later. This is Uprising. We'll continue our coverage of pro-democracy movements and holding power accountable with a discussion on Ferguson. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. The events of this summer and fall in Missouri have forever made the simmering issues of racism and police brutality against black Americans synonymous with the word Ferguson. The killing of Michael Brown by Officer Darren Wilson and the subsequent failure to even indict him, let alone try and convict him, seems to have sparked a movement with momentum. Not only did thousands of people the nation over rise up in solidarity with protesters, the ripple effect has reached the White House and Justice Department. President Obama on Monday met with a number of people, including activists and law enforcement officials, and announced some modest policy changes, while Attorney General Eric Holder has pledged to address racial profiling by federal police. Joining me in studio today is Tanya Siswe Chimarenga. She's a Los Angeles-based independent reporter, and she's also the author of the book, No Doubt, The Murders of Oscar Grant. Welcome to Uprising, Tandi. Thank you so much for having me, Sonali. Well, first, what do you make of, before we get into the activism, uh, before we get into this rallying cry of Black Lives Matter, let's talk about how officials have responded. What do you make of President Obama's response to Ferguson this week? Mm -hmm. uh, on Monday, he met with a number of people, including some activists, and he's announced for, among other things, $75 million in funding for police to wear body-worn cameras. The Police Foundation likes this because they did a study showing that uh, police um, incidents um, dropped 50% when police feel that they're being watched. Do you think this is even a tiny step in the right direction? Well, as you know, Sonali, I was in Ferguson in August of last mm -hmm. year. This I year, talked yeah. um, This year, mm -hmm. sorry. I talked with a number of people on the ground who had hoped that President Obama would have come through sooner to at least address the people, to at least address the issue. So, you know, waiting until this last moment, waiting until everything has blown up is... Um, part of the disappointment. The other part of the disappointment is that even though there have been studies that talk about the drop in incidents with body armor, mm -hmm. 
Um, for example, here in Los Angeles, we had a situation where the Los Angeles Police Department at a particular um, substation, their camera, their, uh, excuse me, their microphones, which were supposed to be recording audio, the antennas had been disabled from every single car hmm. in the parking lot. So body armor, which is left in the hands of cops, is not going to do a thing. They can always be turned off. Uh, the excuse can always be given that they've malfunctioned. So uh, besides, in addition to the fact that any monies that go further into police hands as opposed to resources into the community, as opposed to resources to create civilian oversight and control of the police, is probably the direction that needs to be gone, and as opposed to what we're hearing now from the president. Right. Now, let's talk about uh, the fact that Attorney General Eric Holder, whose tenure is ending as he's announced his resignation, has at least started to also address um, uh, racial profiling, at least by federal police. This, uh, I mean, this is a huge issue in New York. We have the stop and frisk policies. And we know that even when police departments don't have official racial profiling policies, they do it. We understand right. implicit bias all too well. Right, right. Well, as you know, again, um, he's leaving in January. When he came in August and spoke, he talked about the fact that he had had similar experiences as a young black man growing up, but he's leaving office, number one. Uh, number two, under his tenure with the Justice Department, there, have, there has been no federal database of the numbers of people who right. have been killed by police. So we have to wonder what is going to become of what he's talking about. What is going to become of this investigation by the Justice Department into the Ferguson Police Department? is that going to flounder once he leaves office? So right. the question is up in the air of exactly what's going to happen from a federal level. And the question that many activists have is how can we get the resources here on the ground to do the work that we know needs to be done? Right, and it's incredible that we do not as a country keep track of people killed by police. We keep track of all sorts of things, yes, but we, we do. don't keep track of, on a federal level, you know, individual police departments may keep their own numbers, but as a country, we don't do that. I want to um, talk specifically about the Ferguson Police Department and some of the things that have not gotten very much attention nationally, mm -hmm. but people on the ground in Ferguson are seeing uh, these things, and that is the, the presence of um, very open white supremacist hate groups, yes. such as the KKK that such have... Ferguson Police Department. So, and, and so so some have even said that there are connections between the KKK and the Ferguson Police Department. The KKK very openly began fundraising for Darren Wilson. This was reported by USA Today. They mm -hmm. they began fundraising for uh, Wilson in just the weeks after Michael Brown was killed. How, what are those connections? Has anyone found evidence of, re of real connections? I don't know of any organizations that have taken it upon themselves to actually do that research. Mm -hmm. uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center which is known for researching and tracking hate groups, that would be an excellent project for them to undertake. But what we do know based upon the history of this country is that uh, white supremacist movements such as the KKK have always been secret organizations. During the particular time period right after enslavement, however, even though it's still a secret organization, the relationships between the Klan and police was widely known by the people who lived in that community. It's not widely known right now what the relationships are between the Klan and the Ferguson Police Department or most police departments across the country, but I'm sure in those communities um, the speculation is so high as to run almost as a surety, mm. not so much a speculation by the people who actually live in those communities. Right. Uh, the KKK has also, uh, one of its leaders threatened to kill anyone wearing a Guy Fawkes mask. Apparently this was in response to the hacktivist collective Anonymous posting publicly uh, the personal information of this one leader named Frank Ancona. Mm -hmm. That's spelled A-N-C-O-N-A, -A, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he calls himself the imperial wizard of the traditionalist American Knights. And mm -hmm. then just a week ago, Michael Brown Sr.'s church, the church where Michael Brown's father mm -hmm. was baptized was burned down and the pastor uh, Carlton Lee who has been active in Ferguson organizing thinks that uh, the white supremacist groups like the KKK might have been behind it mm -hmm. we know that history don't we we know that history very well and to attempt to link the church burning of Michael Brown seniors family to the protesters for justice for Michael Brown is going to fall flat. That's not going to go anywhere. So it's not far-fetched speculation to think that the Klan had something to do with it. Uh, as far as their, the Klan's threats on killing people with Guy Fawkes masks, to my knowledge, it has not happened yet. 
Yeah. Right, and another person who, uh, who, I mean, it was amazing to think about the, the fear mongering that took place before the decision was announced mm -hmm. was that uh, black rioters were going to be burning things down. Well, a black church was burnt down, mm -hmm. and the pastor thinks it was white supremacist group. Mm -hmm. That black rioters were going to be killing people. The one person that died in the days following the mm -hmm. uh, demonstrations was a young black man, a mm -hmm. 20 year old man named DeAndre Joshua. He apparently was a friend of Michael Brown's. The, the New York Times did an article saying that um, he was not, in fact, a grand jury witness, although some thought that he was. He knew Michael Brown. He was killed not far, and nobody knows how he died. He was shot mm -hmm. in the head and was burned in his own car. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about this. Right, it's, right. It's, now, is this the car that was left across the street from the Michael Brown Memorial? Because I did see a burned out, the remains of a burned out car over there. Anything that would bring shame or disgrace or dishonor to that area where Michael Brown was killed is not going to be done by those people that live in the Canfield Green Apartments or those people who want justice for Michael uh, Brown. And even the looting, quote unquote, the burning of buildings in the West Florissant area, there have been reports that police either set the fires or law enforcement and fire departments allowed them to burn. Now, we've been given this huge buildup, um, state police, the National Guard, the state of emergency, all of this militarization, and yet they're still allow allowing stuff to burn. Right. How is it that people even got close enough to allow, to, to, to get to those areas? Right. What was the militarization and the buildup for? And, and what you're saying was confirmed by uh, people like Michelle Gross, who, who runs a local organization against police brutality. She spoke mm -hmm. to RT.com, and she said exactly the same thing, that mm -hmm. police were simply standing by, the fire trucks weren't called in, buildings were burned, mm -hmm. so that they could say, you know, essentially after the fact, look at all these buildings that burned, look at all these cars that burned, whether we know who started it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of speculation um, that there might have been provocateurs, and, and we may never know who those people well, really see, here's were. The, here's the thing about it. In the days following Michael Brown's murder by Darren Wilson, when the first quote-unquote looting occurred out on West Florissant Avenue, if you go back and research it, you will see a clip of some young black men standing in front of a store saying, there's not going to be any looting here. We're not going to allow that to happen. So we know the communities are more than capable of policing themselves. We've seen footage where a young uh, either Latino man or white male, I'm not sure of his ethnicity, some people identified him as anarchist, I don't know, but the footage talks about the fact that he was throwing things at the police and the protester, protesters outed him and got him out of the area. So we know the people in that community are more than capable of, of policing themselves. Why you've got this buildup of police and then stuff still happens, you know, we can call it speculation, but you know, the people on the ground they probably already know. They we're know speculating because we're not there. Right. Um, another group of, of people that uh, came to Ferguson uh, in these days before and during the uh, uh, grand jury decision was this very strange group calling themselves the Oath Keepers. They're mm -hmm. a mysterious group of mostly white armed men who did a very pr provocative thing. They took up positions on the rooftops of buildings in Ferguson with sharpshooters and mm -hmm. claimed that they were protecting property. They also claimed that they did, wanted to make sure that there was no police brutality, that they wanted to protect businesses and the protesters. But the uh, Ferguson Police Department didn't arrest them. They arrested hundreds yeah. of others. They mm -hmm. simply told them nicely to leave because they didn't, said they, they didn't agree with them. Mm -hmm. Double standards here. Double, sta double standards is, is a mild way yeah. of putting it. The, the, the history and the current reality bears out the fact that black people are feared and lies are told about our propensity for violence, that we want to burn everything down, we want to tear everything up, we want to shoot everybody, and we don't do it. But historically, who are the ones that do it? Groups like the Klan, groups like these Oath Keepers, white males in particular. Serial shooters, and the list goes on. Now, mm -hmm. let's talk about the solidarity protests that we saw around the country, and particularly here in Los Angeles, yes. where this program is produced, where you are based. L.A. saw the largest uh, number of arrests mm -hmm. and possibly the largest protests, uh, and, and lots of other places, of course, protested as well. In Oakland, they shut down a BART station. Even in La Jolla, San Diego, wealthy mm -hmm. La Jolla, San Diego, it was a huge demonstration. People blocked freeways. What happened in L.A.? Can you tell us about some of the organizing that uh, happened here, and why 
is the sense of solidarity so strong in LA? Well, there's been a lot of grassroots organizing by a variety of groups. And as you know, the history of police terrorism in Los Angeles goes back a long, long way. And I think that's probably why Los Angeles reacted the way it did. Now, when uh, the trial of Johannes Mesley for Oscar Grant was moved down here. There was organizing around that. There was not, there was solidarity demonstrations, but there was not that much anger. Uh, there was anger, but there was not a large scale protesting of the verdict the way there was elsewhere. And that's probably adding to this history that we have, of course, of Rodney King, 1965, 1992, et cetera, and so on. So we feel it here in Los Angeles. Uh, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, the Southern California chapter, sustained most of the losses during the history of the Black Panther Party in this country right here in Los Angeles, California. So we feel it very, very much here in Los Angeles. And um, because of that history, that's probably the reason, the, the best reason I can give you for so much uh, organizing, grassroots organizing and solidarity. And again, because of that history, is probably the reason why you have the police reacting the way it did, m making so many legal arrests of protesters. Right, so let's talk about that because the LAPD patted itself on the back saying, mm -hmm. look how well we handled our protests. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't react in the way that Ferguson police did. But this the time, largest number of arrests of all, didn't. right? And but but in, but they simply just arrested everybody, right? right. They, but, they arrested but, but hundreds now, of people. But we remember May Day of 2007 yeah. in MacArthur Park. MacArthur we Park. also remember uh, Occupy being cleared out from downtown Los Angeles. So for the LAPD to pat itself on the back is really uh, insulting. And, and what about the fact that I mean they may not have come down hard and, and pepper sprayed people and fired rubber bullets this time? This time, but they arrested the largest number of, of, of single largest number of people in any one city arrested around Ferguson protests happened in Los Angeles. They simply mm -hmm. put them all away and in that way shut it down, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I suppose that to them that's success. No. Yeah. So <laughs> let's talk about this rallying cry that people have, several rallying cries, right, uh, mm -hmm. out of Ferguson. Mm -hmm. uh, hands up, don't shoot is, is one. Some people um, have, have, have held that up as a way of saying, uh, we are unarmed, we surrender. I don't know what your opinion is about that rallying cry, but there's <laughs> also the broader Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. which is a very basic and um, profound statement. What mm -hmm. do you make of these rallying cries? Well, I know for Black Lives Matter, one of the co-founders of that movement, uh, Patrice Cullors, is here locally. And Patrice is a community organizer. She comes out of organizing against sheriff violence in the LA jails, organizing the families and the victims of that violence, those who have suffered trauma. And so when Trayvon Martin's murderer was acquitted in 2012, George Zimmerman, it began as a hashtag, but Patrice, in conjunction with some of the other co-founders, uh, Alicia Garza in the Bay Area, Opal uh, Tometi in New York, have decided to try and make this a political project that talks about the erasure of black lives. When we talk about uh, all lives matter, all lives are not being uh, murdered by police terrorism. All lives are not being stopped and frisked. Uh, all lives are not being disappeared in the media when, uh, for example, black women are, go missing. So to say that black lives matter means that you're going to catch everyone when you recognize the fact who's catching the most hell, as Malcolm X used to say, and uh, not only those people speaking for themselves, speaking for their communities about what they're going through, but taking the leadership of this movement against police terror. And I should mention some uh, right-wing um, pro-life uh, activists have taken up the All Lives Matter uh, slogan to make the case that um, uh, black babies are being aborted, which is something that they're greatly concerned with, although they don't seem to care as much. For the uh, black children that are children. already here. So yeah. yes, that, that, that noise is going to get drowned out. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, what about hands up, don't shoot? Well, again, if you go back to the beginning, and that's, this is just my opinion, Back to the beginning, there's a video out there in the world that shows the very first demonstration at the site where Michael Brown was murdered. It's about a thousand people, maybe at minimum, at that particular area who are angry, who are hurt, who are frustrated. And the police come in with sirens blaring, with SUVs. They get out of their car, some with M16 or, or, or AR-15 rifles. No attempt at community mediation, uh, no attempt at dialogue to this community about what has just happened where Michael Brown has laid in the street for four and a half hours. No attempt whatsoever. And this crowd 
begins to form and pushes the police back into the vehicles. All they're saying is hands up, hands up, hands up. This entire crowd is rallying around the fact that Michael Brown's hands were up and he was surrendering and he was still murdered. And those police officers, some of them got back into their vehicles, others came from behind with um, police dogs, canines, which is never a good idea. And the rest, as we say, is history. And so that's where that rallying cry comes from. It's, like I said, a minimum of a thousand people, angry, hurt, frustrated, but they're facing down police with blaring sirens, with uh, automatic weapons, and they're saying to him, his hands were up. Yeah. Our hands are up. Are you really going to kill us too? Yeah. I don't think so. Tandi, you know, we've talked about white supremacist groups. Mm -hmm. We've talked about right-wing uh, conservative groups. But Robert McCulloch, the uh, LA, uh, St. Louis uh, pro County prosecuting attorney, is a Democrat. Governor mm -hmm. Jane Nixon is a Democrat. The chain of command in Ferguson, Claire McCaskill, Senator Claire McCaskill is a Democrat. The majority of people in power in Missouri are Democrats, the same people who have swept this under the rug. We can't just blame this on conservatives and Republicans. No, no you certainly cannot. And in a, what I've been told by activists there on the ground, they told me you have to come to St. Louis, you have to come to Ferguson to see for yourselves because you're obviously not going to believe me. So when I get there, yes, it is almost like a plantation. Mm. The Democratic Party in Missouri today is reminiscent of the Democratic Party at the turn of the century. The Democratic Party were the ones, the party of white supremacy. They were the party of the Klan. And it was in 1948 that the Democrats bolted and tried to start the Dixiecrat Party for a moment. These were the Southern Democrats who were mad at FDR for his um, overtures at desegregating the armed forces and other federal industries. And as we know, later on, those same people became conservatives right. uh, after Barry Goldwater's presidential run. Well, I want to thank you so much, Tandi, as always, for shedding some light on these issues and providing much-needed context. And thanks so thank much for joining so much us. Thank you so much for having me. My guest is Tandi Cesare Chimaranga. She's an independent reporter and author of the book, No Doubt, The Murders of Oscar Grant. And uh, that does it for our program today. You've been listening and watching Uprising. B. Pasha Shom is our producer and our program director. Haya Radwan is our research intern. Camilo Ramirez and Christian Beck are our production interns. Annie Mendoza is our media intern. Brett Collins is our technical director. Teddy Robinson and Jonathan Alexander are our audio engineers. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel right now at youtube.com slash uprising with Sonali. Our website is uprisingwithsonali.com. Our theme music is by Quetzal. I'm Sonali. Nicole Hutker, host and executive producer of Uprising. I'll see you tomorrow.